Hare Krishna. So thank all of you for coming today. Evening for celebration of Janmashtami. And I will speak of today on how Krishna descends to this world to demonstrate how to respond to adversity with dignity. Often one of the oldest questions which people have since time immemorial is why do bad things happen to good people? Have any of you had this question? Almost every day, is it? <laughs> so, now that is a complicated question, but a more useful question is not why do bad things happen to good people, but what do good people do when bad things happen to them? Nature of the world is bad things are going to happen. So Krishna, when he descends to the world, even at that time bad things are happening. And he does set many bad things right. But when bad things happen, how do those who are trying to live virtuously, those who are trying to live devotedly, how do they respond? So I'll talk about the story of Krishna's appearance in this world from this perspective. So Krishna, as God, exists in another world. There are basically two levels of reality, the material and the spiritual. The material level is where we all are living. And beyond this is another level which is eternal, which is spiritual, which is indestructible. And that is where God resides. And each one of us has a deep longing to love and be loved. And not only do we long to love and be loved, we long for lasting love. The movies, the novels, many of them are about romance. And much romance is about happy ever after. Now if you look at the reality of the world, nothing lasts forever. And yet we all long to last forever and to love forever. So where does this longing come from? Imagine if a child were living in a remote tribe in Africa, which is disconnected from the whole world. And one day that child comes to his mother and says, Mom, Mom, I want a pizza. Now what do you think the mother will ask? What do you think she will ask? What? What is a pizza? Isn't it? Or even if she knows, when did you hear about it? So, if there is nothing in our circumstance which, with nothing in the child's circumstance, which can trigger any thoughts of pizza, then naturally the question will come, where did this desire come from? So similarly, if we look at the world around us, nothing lasts forever. Even huge mountains, they began at a particular time, they will end at a particular time. Our whole earth itself. So if nothing around us lasts forever, where does our desire to live forever and to love forever come from? This desire, the Bhagavad Gita and the spiritual traditions of the world explain that this comes from our core. At our core, we are souls and we are indestructible. And the soul is a part of the whole. That whole is God, who is known by different names and different traditions. The bhakti tradition knows him by the name of Krishna. So, the soul and the whole, we and God have an eternal relationship of love. Eternal relationship is what we are longing for. So the idea that there is some other world beyond this world, it is not just some religious fantasy. It is actually seen in the deepest longing of our heart. So Krishna descends from the spiritual world to this world to help us fulfill that longing. Now when he is to be born, actually when about Krishna's appearance in this world, we don't use the word born because he is eternal. So his appearance is like the sun's rising. To our vision, it seems to have come just now at a particular time, but actually the sun is always existing. So before his appearance, Things were very dramatic and traumatic. 
Although God is the source of everyone, God does not delight in bossing over everyone. God delights in the reciprocation of love. And thus he performs Leela. Leela means that he voluntarily subordinates his Godhood to have loving reciprocations with others. And for that purpose, he takes on some role. He gives his devotees some roles. So although God is the source and the father of pa parent of everyone, but he, when he descends to this world, he has his parents. And that is, those devotees who want to love him very deeply and love him in the mood of parents, he gives them that role. The idea is that God, we all want to enjoy a rich gamut of relationships. God is the whole, so he also wants to do the same. So Krishna, when he descends to this world, he chooses his parents to be two, two royal, a royal couple, Vasudev and Devaki. Now Vasudev and Devaki are just married and it's their wedding ceremony just ended and was Devaki's brother, cousin brother Kamsa, is so happy that his sister is married that he is driving the chariot of Vasudev and Devaki so that they can go out, go to their home. And suddenly at that time, a celestial prophecy comes up. A voice is heard mysteriously from the sky saying, Oh Kamsa, you fool! You are carrying the chariot of this person whose eighth child will be the cause of your death. As soon as Kamsa hears this, he is very lovingly carrying his, driving his sister as a charioteer. And the next moment he rips out his sword catches Devaki by the hair and is about to lock off, lock off her head. This is a disaster. Is at any time, killing anyone is terrible. But killing someone who is your own sister in extreme is, is, is much, much horrible. And to kill, kill your sister at the time of her wedding, it's even worse. So his whole character changes the moment he hears this threat. So basically everybody can behave like a lady and a gentleman in normal times. But adversity introduces us to ourselves. Adversity introduces us to people. The part of us which we keep hidden when we are provoked, that's the time the part comes out. So Kamsa was looking like a cultured person, but suddenly he turned into a demonic person, was out to murder. And then at that time, Vasudev. Vasudev and Devaki were all very pious and devoted. Now to be devoted has two parts, and that will be the central theme of this class. That to be devoted means to be faithful and to be resourceful to be faithful and to be resourceful. So what does this two things mean? That in our life, at every situation, some things are in our control and some things are out of our control. So when somebody is devoted to God, when we face adversity, basically what happens? Adversity means, see, the things which are out of control, they go wildly out of control. And the things that are in control, they seem to shrink a lot. So that we start feeling powerless. So when this dynamic is there, there are some things out of control, some things in our control. A devotional disposition is to be faithful and to be resourceful. To be faithful means that that which has gone out of control, okay, it has gone out of control, but something good will emerge out of it. So, Faith doesn't mean that we just passively, oh, everything is good, everything will be good. No, faith means, it's faithfulness means, okay, things have gone out of order now. But when we function in the world, there is always some chaos and some order. When things are orderly, that means when we do particular thing, the expected result comes. When things are chaotic, 
we do something and we don't know what result will come for example all of you are sitting now here for the talk now all of you are reasonably confident that the person next to you is not going to suddenly turn at you and slap you in the face <laughs> now you know we not even know the people next to you but you come for this talk you have that reasonable amount of faith. so there is some order and that enables us to function but sometimes the order goes away and chaos comes in. so to be faithful means that when from order chaos comes we have the faith that from the chaos some better order will come we don't deny the chaos right now but from order through chaos to order will come that a better order will emerge and one simple example to illustrate this could be when a child is in the mother's womb at that time there is some order the child is safe the mother takes all possible care and things are ordered but then when the labor starts there's a lot of pain and we don't know why this particular pain is coming which pain will come next how frequently the contractions will come or whatever but through that chaos if there is perseverance then there is a better order the child comes out of the womb and then there is new life the mother is happy the child is now out of that constricted womb the child has a fresh life so the universe moves for this thing so to be faithful means to understand that when from order chaos is coming from that chaos a better order will come but that doesn't mean this is going to happen automatically one part is things are out of control we have that faith that things something better will come out but to be faithful is to be complemented by being resourceful resourceful means that that which is in our control we need to do to the best of our capacity so now comes a thought that if her eight child is going to kill me i will kill her only so that she will never have any children and i will not die now when this happened vasudev who was the husband of devaki at that time it was a emergency for him and his his wife his bride's hair had been grabbed by this person kamsa was demonia very powerful Vasudev could have fought over there, but it had led to hell. And normally, in traditional cultures, the wedding happens at the girl's place, so that all of Kamsa's cahoots were there. So Vasudev was resourceful, and Vasudev spoke various things over there to try to pacify Kamsa. And finally, he said he tried to pacify and dissuade Kamsa, but he was not ready to do so. he told him that actually things life and death happens by destiny if you are trying to die then this grievous sin of killing your own sister will not save you from that it's interesting he doesn't turn around that logic and say i think that if life and death happen by destiny then if devaki is just trying to die then what am i doing trying to reason She's going to die. He doesn't think that way. Why? Because he's not responsible. He is not using destiny to become passive and responsible. He's thinking resourcefully. What can I do? So destiny determines what happens to us. Destiny doesn't determine what we do. That is determined by our responsibility, by our duty. So anyway, he resourcefully comes up with a reason. Finally, with the with the reasoning that will pacify comes. He says, "Oh, comes up." The threat for you is not from Devaki; it is from her sons. And he assures her, whenever she has a son, I will hand that son over to you. When a problem, when a disaster cannot be avoided, the best that we can do is it can be delayed. Maybe in the intervening, some solution will come. So he has faith in that celestial prophecy that has come, but still he is resourceful. And here we see, come Vasudev and Devaki are good people. They are pious. They are devoted. But still, a terrible thing happens to them. Not just a bad thing, but a terrible thing happens to them. 
and there is no miraculous intervention to stop that calamity from befalling them. And then they go ahead and they have a child, and Vasudeva putting a stone on his heart, hands over that child to Kamsa. And Kamsa ruthlessly kills that child. One, two, three. They have six children, and all six of them are killed. And then after that, there are seven children. And Kamsa is preparing the seven child also. But apparently, Devaki has a miscarriage and the seven child is mysterious. Now that seven child is mysteriously taken from Mathura to Vrindavan and that seven child becomes Krishna's older brother, Balaram. And then the eighth child appears. So the eighth child is, who is that? Krishna. Now, the great saintly teachers explain that this whole story is historical, but it is not just historical. When, when we have in scripture, in our wisdom traditions, certain stories, those stories have been preserved for thousands and thousands of years because those stories were meaningful for people for believing. And if it's just simple history, it may have some interest for people with historical interest. But these are stories which demonstrate eternal spiritual truths. And while the story is history, but it is not as history, it is more than history. It is telling incidents that happened at a particular time, but those incidents reveal patterns that are universal. So Devaki's womb represents our heart. And the six children that were born to Devaki, they, are, they represent the six impurities in the human heart. These impurities are lust, anger, greed, envy, pride and illusion. Now these impurities need to be removed from the heart. And their removal can be painful. It can appear brutal when that happens. Somebody is proud and then they face situations that crush their pride. That's painful. Now, when our pride is crushed, we have two choices. Either when the pride is crushed, there can be humiliation or there can be humility. Humiliation is when pride is frustrated. Humility is when pride is rejected. So when I want to be a big person and life crushes me and I still want to be a big person, I want to lord it over others and I can't, then I feel humiliated. But I accept, actually, I'm a soul, I'm a part of God and my eternal role is actually to serve. Sometimes I serve as a leader, sometimes I serve as a follower. Sometimes I serve in a big position, sometimes I serve in a small position. If we develop that humility, then we'll be able to move forward in life. So, going through pride is painful. But if we let ourselves get humiliated, then the pain goes on and on and on and on. But if we let the removal of pride lead to humility, then we move on with life. So, now here, somebody might ask, Asudev and Devaki knew their sons are going to be killed. And why would they have sons at They went through it because they tried that faith that something better would emerge in the future. So, our lust, anger, greed, if they get, we get purified of them, that can be painful. But we perceive here, something good will happen. Everything that happens is not good, necessarily. But, good can emerge through everything that happens. Everything that happens may not be good, but good can emerge through everything that happens. Now the seventh child, which appeared and, that dis and disappeared, that represents Balaram, that is Balaram. Balaram represents the Guru. So the Guru comes in our hearts to purify our hearts. So, Balram appeared in the womb for some time, purified the womb, and then he disappeared. 
so that Krishna could appear over there. As the Guru prepares our heart for Krishna to manifest over there. And then the eight child was conceived. The eight child manifested first in Vasudev's heart and then in Devaki's womb. And Devaki became effulgent by that. Naturally, a mother who has seen seven children die, she could be chronically depressed. But when Krishna came in her heart, she became alive. This is the power of devotion. But even amidst the greatest distress, we are uplifted by some kind of sublime happiness. And then as the pregnancy progressed, earlier she had been fearful what would happen to her child. But this time she was fearless. And seeing her fearless, Kamsa became fearful. What is going to happen? The same child. And he was waiting, he was waiting. Kamsa was a demon. But although he was a demon, still he was civilized enough that he did not think of inducing a forced abortion in Devaki. He waited for the child to be born. And then, when finally the child appeared. So, it, normally when a child is born, we often tell people happy birthday. On the, on the day of our birth, we were not happy. It's a traumatic change. As I said, it's a chaos from which order is emerging. So every child who is born is crying. And it's curious how paradoxical things are. When the child is crying, everybody becomes happy. And if the child is not crying, everyone becomes worried. <laughs> so, in life, sometimes, Pain brings pleasure and the absence of pain brings anxiety. So we can't just look at the immediate emotion that we are going through. We have to look at the direction at which things are going. From the child's perspective, crying is painful. But the very crying indicates the presence of life, the presence of health. So if we get too caught in the present alone, in the way how things are right now, then we miss out on the big picture. Yes, we have to look at the present, but human life means we, we have the intelligence to look beyond the present to how things are going in the future. So even if there is present pain, we can accept that pain if it will take us to a brighter future. And this was the mood of Devaki and Vasudev. And when they had the seventh, eighth child, at the time of the birth, Krishna appeared not like an ordinary child crying with all messy fluids around him. Krishna appeared fully dressed, wearing ornaments, wearing with grown hair, putting chatur bhuja, four arms. And his parents were stunned to see this magnificent child. So they knew that somebody very powerful was going to come. Because comes out the powerful demon and whoever would best him would have to be powerful. But still, it actually it happened, they were stunned. And after that, as things moved on, this whole thing, they offered prayers to Krishna. And Devaki was delighted to see Krishna, but still, when actually she saw the child, and she said, Oh, what will happen to this child? Now, Kamsa will really try to kill you because he can know that you are not an ordinary child, you are a divine being. So please. Please hide your divinity so that Kamsa will not be that averse to you. Then Krishna obliged. And as a small baby changes form from four arms to two arms. Now when such miracles happen, actually some of our skeptical minds say, how oh, can a child be born with four children? Four, four arms. Yeah, it's not possible for an ordinary child. The universe works according to certain laws. But God exists above those laws. And therefore, miracles are not against science to study the laws of nature. Miracles are not against science, miracles are about science. And Krishna appeared with his four hands majestically and then he changed himself to two arms. And he changed to two arms, 
Then he became like an ordinary small child. And then here was something significant. So now, again, we see the dynamic of being faithful and being resourceful manifested. Vasudeva Devaki had seen that this child Krishna has come over here. So, he's gone, but he's also a small baby. So, as they were waiting, thinking, what is Kamsa going to do now? So then, suddenly Vasudeva noticed. Uh, Vasudeva and Nirki had been arrested by Kamsa, and they had been kept in a prison cell. Suddenly, and not only had been kept in a prison cell, they had been shattered inside that cell. So then, suddenly Vasudeva Nirki noticed that. Vasudeva's shackles had fallen off. And as they looked, they saw that the doors opened miraculously. And then as they looked around, the guards over there, the guards had fallen asleep. And deep asleep. And then Vasudeva suddenly got the idea. So I had to do something to protect Krishna. What do I do? Here there is Mathura where Kamsa is ruling, but across the river jungle, there is my friend, my cousin, was, was this Nandamukha, Nanda. Let me take some guidance for him, he with him. Let me take Krishna out there. Immediately he took Krishna and started. Now, this guidance is got by divine will, but still, the difficulties suddenly started raining, stormy rains, because the river Jamuna is going to be. And as the river Jamuna was there, he was started crossing, but the Jamuna started overflowing. And he was carrying his baby with him. He wanted to hold the baby and touch the baby for as long as he could. But then he realized I cannot get across, go across this river. So he got a basket. And he held the basket on his head. And the water started rising, rising, rising. And as the water was rising, he had to raise the basket higher and higher. Now Jamuna is, was seen to be rising and threatening. And suddenly, as he raised the basket higher, suddenly the basket slipped off his hand. It was a stormy wave hit his hands. And he picked up the basket, but the baby had disappeared from us. panic! Agony afflicted him and started frantically searching. Where is that baby? He's searching, 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 searching. I just couldn't find it. He dove into the water, looked here, looked there. And as he kept looking, looking, hope started dwindling. He looked around, looked around, dove deep into the river, and suddenly he saw Krishna. And he picked up the baby again. And he found the basket nearby floating. Put the baby in that basket. And then, as he was walking across, suddenly the river calmed down. The river calmed down. So he described that Jamuna is also a devotee. And Jamuna wanted to be blessed by the touch of Krishna's Padakamal, his lotus feet. So once Krishna fell into the river, Jamuna was blessed, and Jamuna calmed down. And after that, Vasudeva could go straight forward. And Vasudeva came to Nanda Maharaj. As house, and then quietly he kept Krishna over there, and now he couldn't go back empty handed because Kamsa would know that the child is going to be, was going to be born. Where did he go? So there was a child, there was a girl child who would be born over there. So he took that child and he came back. Now, naturally, he would have been worried what will happen to this girl child, but he was doing his part and he had faith. Something higher will do its part. And when he came back, and he kept that girl child over there. And Kamsa woke up and he came. 
And when he heard about him, that the child is being born, he's in charge fiercely over there. And then Devaki told him, this is a girl, she is not left to you. Comes out, taken aback. Then, maybe this girl will kill you. So he grabbed that girl and he tried to fling her on the ground to kill her, as he had done earlier. In fact, as he raised her up, suddenly she slipped out of her hands, out of his hands. And he looked up and that girl turned into a powerful, effulgent goddess. And she said, you fool, why are you trying to kill me? The one who has this time to kill you is already born at And saying this, she disappeared. Now Kamsa was trying to see what happened. This girl is disappeared. But Kamsa thought that maybe this was all a cheating. He thought that actually this whole plot was there is to fool me. There's no eight child who's going to kill me. And he begged for forgiveness from Kamsa and for Australia and David. He says, I was misled and said, I'll kill your children. I'll kill your children. And then it's all in God. But it seems even the gods have started lying now. They made that prophecy. That's why I did all this. You please, please forgive me for the wrong that I did. Now, if your children have been killed, the forgive is not easy. But amazingly, it was a day when forgive. Now, it's interesting. I will go on this one and then do the conclusion lesson over there. And you can have a couple of questions. See, they, they, there is a difference between forgiving and trusting. Forgiving is for the past. Trust is for the future. If somebody has hurt us, if we hold what they have hurt against us for the rest of our life, it is we who will hurt ourselves by that. So let the past be in the past. So forgiving is for the past. But if somebody has hurt us, we cannot again give them the power to hurt us. So it creates a mistress. So forgiveness is to be given, but trust has to be forgiven. So Vasudev and Devaki were forgiving in the sense, okay, we don't hold the past to kill our six children against you. But they didn't trust comes. They didn't say, tell them, oh, actually, our eight child is there in Vrinda. That would have been stupid. So they were faithful that Krishna only protected. But they were resourceful that they didn't spill, spill the beans and tell that Krishna is there. So eventually, Krishna grew up and Krishna freed the world of this child that comes up. But the point over here is that Krishna came as God. But his descent did not mean that he miraculously set everything right. He guided his devotees to be both faithful and resourceful. And in our lives, when we pray, when we seek help, sometimes miracles may not happen. But if we learn these two principles, then no matter what bad things happen, in our life, the Vasudeva and bad things were happening, they didn't ask, why are our sons being killed like this? What wrong did we do? Now, the question why do bad things happen to good people is a different, difficult question which we sometimes have the most satisfactory answer. But a more productive question is what do bad good people do when bad things happen? And they do good things. As we learn from this story, they are faithful and they are resourceful. So, for whatever difficulties we are facing in our life, faithful means okay, this bad thing is happening. This Chaos is coming, chaos is coming in my life, but some order will be my job. Rather than simply becoming depressed, disheartened by the chaos that we are going through, we perceive the order, waiting for the order to come. So that's faithfulness. But faithfulness is not passivity, it's not apathy. Faithful also is resourceful. What can I do in this situation? And what is the best that I can do in this situation? And this is where, if we turn towards God, if we pray to Him, if we practice Bhakti Yoga, which is the means of connecting with Him, we will become internally strengthened. We will become internally strengthened to face the difficulties that we are having. The difficulties may go away after time, but when the difficulty is there, 
Life determines our problems, we determine their sons. The more we think about the problem, the bigger it grows, the more it travels. But if we turn towards God, we devote ourselves to God, then that awareness that God is far bigger than me, God is far bigger than my problems. And He will orchestrate things so that good will come out of the bad. That awareness will decrease the burden of the problem in us. See, problems are like, all of us they try to carry a big weight. It's difficult. So problems are also like a big burden on us. But problems are such a burden that the more we think about it, the burden's weight increases. So imagine you're carrying a 10 kg weight and you keep thinking, oh, it's 10 kg, 10 kg, 10 kg. And you find it's become 20 kg. You find it's become 30 kg. You find it's become 100 kg. You become crushed. So our problems are like that. The more we think about them, the more their weight increases and the more we feel crushed. So instead of thinking about the problem, not that we don't think about it at all, but we don't like, we don't overthink about it. We turn and turn to God in prayer, in devotion, in meditation. And that, just stopping thinking about our problems and thinking about Krishna will give us relief, will give us strength. We can either do chinta or we can do chintan. Then we can just worry about our problems and feel burdened. If we prayed as much as we worried, we would have to worry much lesser. Because that prayer, even if it doesn't remove the problems, prayer will remove the burden of the problems in us. And we will get strength to move forward in our lives, to move forward for this world. And that is the spiritual strength that each one of us can have if we turn inwards. So Krishna descends to this world to remind us of our own spiritual strength, to help us gain the resources by which we can develop our spiritual strength. And if bad things happen, we may have to live with pain, but we won't have to live in pain. The problem will be a part of our life, and the problem will consume us entire life. And if we keep moving forward purposefully, we will find in new course that whatever bad thing happened, by God's grace, something good, something better emerged from it. So this, how to deal with adversity with dignity, this is what Krishna teaches for us. And if we learn this lesson, we can all be empowered in our journey. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on this theme of don't ask why bad things happen to good people, but ask what do good people do when bad things happen to them. Krishna comes to teach how we can respond to adversity with dignity. So when Krishna comes to this world, his parents get into big trouble. Their, his mother's life is threatened and then his all her children are threatened and then killed. But through it all, they persevere. What are the two principles for responding to difficulties? Do you remember? Faithful and resourceful. So faithful means the things that are not in our control, which seem to be terribly bad. We have the faith that the universe moves purposefully. From order, if chaos has come, from chaos, better order will come. The mother's the womb, the child in the mother's womb is order. When there's delivery, there's pain, there's chaos. So not a better order will come. So if we have that faith, everything that happens may not be good, but good can emerge through everything that happens. So Vasudev had the faith that the prophecy will come true, but he was resourceful to prevent the death of David. When a problem cannot be removed, at least we will So that some resource comes up to deal with. And then eventually, when the eighth child was born, the six children who were killed, it might seem brutal. But it represents the six impurities in our heart that is clean, so that God can, with all His purity, can manifest in our heart and illumine our heart in our life. Eventually, when Krishna was born, Vasudev had faith, but he was also resourceful. He took Krishna across to safety. And when Kamsa was apologetic, he forgave, but he did not trust. Forgiveness is for the past, trust is for the future. And in that way, Krishna's appearance in this world heralded the future and Krishna would deliver the world of Kamsa. For all of us, whenever difficulties come upon us, instead of letting that difficulty, that problem burden us, because problem is a burden whose weight increases the more we think about it. So, 
we think about the problem to the extent what is in my control, what can I do about it. And if what we can't do, stop thinking about it and turn to God in prayer. That will give us the inner strength. Just thinking about Krishna can give us strength by which we can face the burden of the problem without the world. And then we take small steps doing what is in our power. And if we keep doing what is in our power, the problems may remain, but they won't open up. So we have to live with pain, but we won't have to live in pain. And if you persevere, we discover that what, what seemed bad in the moment, eventually something good emerged. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. If anyone have any questions, uh, we have a mic and I can pass it on. Hare Krishna. How do you define death? Death to the death of a young one in this context. I mean, how will the death of a young one bring order? Or how will it bring good in the future? How will the death of a young one bring order and bring good? Yes. For all of us, when anything happens, we, we place the cause-effect correlation in different causal boxes. Say for example, right now, if the lights go off, we could put it in one causal box, has the power gone off in this room? Or we could say, has accidentally somebody switched off the power? We could say, oh, has the power grid collapsed over? So we could put this same event the power going off in different causal boxes. One causal box is the power has gone off. Another is power, power grid has collapsed. Another is the switch has been accidentally turned off. So now it could also be that maybe Canada has been attacked by terrorists and the power plant has been blown up. But if we start thinking about that first thing, we will understand that. So whenever anything happens, we need to find the most constructive causal box in which to place the and if a smaller causal box doesn't make sense, then we go a small, then we go to a bigger causal box, and then we go to even bigger causal box. Now, science, the more knowledge we have, the bigger we can expand the causal box. The science can tell us that if the, there is there is a sudden solar flare, and it comes close to the earth, and all the electrical equipment on the earth can stop working. So the causal box can only be extended to the sun's emissions for something simple as simple as a light like on earth. So similarly, when a small child dies, if we look at it from the immediate causal box perspective, it doesn't make any sense. And that's why the causal box needs to be expanded. And expanding the causal box means causal box means cause effect correlation. So the Bhagavad Gita explains that every one of us is a soul. And each soul is on a multi life journey of spiritual evolution. And for the soul, death is a comma, not a full stop. It is a comma by which life continues in a different place, at a different level of reality. So each of us is born, we live for a certain time, and we die. Now, for some, some souls, in this life, they might be destined to live for a very short life. So, there is nothing that the child has done in this life. There is no order or chaos to be considered from this life's perspective. But from a bigger perspective, perspective of previous life, next life, then it could be that, that for that soul's onward evolution, this life, with whatever situation that soul was in, may not be as conducive as the future life is. So, whatever is in our control, we do the best that we can. So, if the child is alive, parents do everything that they can to take care of the child. But if the child passes on, then the parents understand that actually this child is not just my child. It is God's child who was interested in my care. And the same God who took care of this child before, before the child's birth, will take care of the soul after the soul's departure from the soul. Okay. So we'll have one last question. 
If anyone has, you can please raise your hand. Oh, great. So that's our one last question, and then after that, we will proceed to the next part of. Hare Krishna. You mentioned that um, adversity, when there is an adversity or something bad happens, um, I know each people react differently to it. Like um, when, like when the child was killed, um, the mother, each mother reacts to it in a different way. What recommendations or what are your tips so that we can be, you know, like uh, calm and cool at the situation and look at a positive thing in life? Uh, what would you like to share with us so that we can, you know, bear those pains and be more uh, resourceful and look at the positive side of life? Yes, when something terrible happens, different people react differently. So, what can we do to react more positively? All of us have a different body. So, if the temperature drops, some of us may feel very cold. Some of us may not, not, may not feel that cold. Just as each one of us has a different body, each one of us has a different mind also. So, some people might be more emotional and they may need to go through the grieving process. So if somebody is distressed and tell them in great pain, then you tell them, look at the positive. Oh, that, could be, that could be cruel. They have to go through the grieving process. And sometimes they may need to vent out their emotions. And it's not, it's not, it's not to be suppressed at that time. Just like if there is a physical wound, somebody got a fracture. Then initially, the fracture means you keep your hand motionless. So that is a part of the healing process. But after that, the same doctor who told you to keep your hand motionless will then tell, now you move your hands. So no, it pains so much, I don't want to move. No, move it. Although it pains, you move. And then you keep moving, keep moving, and gradually the mobility returns. The hand gets restored to normalcy. So, so, so what applies to physical wounds also applies to emotional wounds. So initially, whenever there is an emotional wound, there is a loss, there is a grieving process. And somebody is going to the grieving process, some people process grief just leave me alone. Some people process grief by they're talking about the person who is departed. And, and they relieve the memories. And whatever the way is required, so people may need a break from their normal life to grieve. And that's why various traditions had some grieving time. But after, if somebody keeps grieving forever, that's like they never moved their hand. So if they have had the grieving, then now we need to push, initially we need to give them space to grieve. And then we may need to give them, um, see there is sometimes people need space and sometimes people need pace. Pace means they need to be pushed to do something. So then, if they go through the green phase, then we need to help them to reintegrate with life again. So reintegrating with life means start doing some normal activities, start getting involved with life. So we need to find out by understanding that person, by hearing from that person, what phase are they going through, and then help them accordingly. In general, to to look at the positive in any situation, then broadly, we need to acknowledge the negative, not deny the negative, but then look for the good around the bad. Okay, this is terrible, but still, okay, you know, these are all the good, still the good things are there in my life. Okay. I, if I lost someone, but still the rest of my family is there, I have health, I have a good job, I have social support, whatever. Look for the good. The mind will keep looking at the bad and will make things worse. But we look for the good around the bad. Then we look for the good that is specifically among the many things good in our life. We look for the good that helps us to counter the bad. Suppose somebody has got a terrible disease. At least, oh, the disease is curable. Oh, I have got health insurance or we have got social security, social support. We can take the treatment. So look for the good that helps us to counter the bad. 
and then look for the good that may emerge from the bad. So okay, this is terrible, but maybe something good will emerge. So I call this the ACE acronym. I have a whole seminar on this topic. ACE your life with positivity. ACE is, A is look for the good around the bad. C is look for the good to counter the bad. And E is look for the good that emerges from the bad. So if we look for the good in this way, then again, we can't say that everything that happens is good. Because bad things happen in life. But everything that happens can be for good. If we play our part in it, if we are faithful and resourceful, so positivity is not just looking at the good, yes, looking at the good is important, but then acting properly is also important. If somebody keeps grieving forever, they become a chronic, chronic lamenter, then even if the good is to emerge, the good will not emerge. It's like the child is, the mother is in pain, but if the mother doesn't push at that time, she has to do her part. She does, she does a push and the child cannot come out. So it's not just looking at the positive, but also acting positively. And we are both faithful and resourceful. And then we look for the good of the ACE, then we can always look forward positively in life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. So now 